Chatterbox is a talking newspaper for Norwich, one of the first established in the country. In 1981, Marianne Lake recorded her history of Norwich. I was kindly given a cassette of this and asked if I could do anything with it. This is the first of two videos using Marianne Lake's voice and principally George Plunkett's photos to tell the history of Norwich. On Christmas Day, 1066, William the Conqueror was crowned King of England in Westminster Abbey. We may resent the foreign conqueror, but two of our greatest treasures must be attributed to his influence, the cathedral and the castle. The oldest thing in Norwich is the castle mound. Perhaps it was already a thousand years old when the conqueror came to these shores. The ancient mound in the heart of Norwich was made higher and the surrounding ditch, which never contained water, was dug deeper. There was a tremendous outburst of activity around Tombland. Khan's stone was brought from Normandy, landed at Yarmouth, sent up the river to Pull's Ferry, and thence transported by a newly dug canal right to the building site, and our cathedral began to take shape. Much of this Norman work remains. The huge semicircular arches of the nave, three stories high, massive pillars to support them, the magnificent central tower on which the delicate 15th century spire sits so comfortably. But the energetic bishop who founded the cathedral, Herbert de Losinga, had other projects in hand. We still have part of his Lazar or Leper Hospital in Sproston Road. It is now a branch library. He also built great churches at King's Lynn and Yarmouth and many smaller churches. A pause in the building of the cathedral about 1120 made stone and workmen available for a new castle and a stone keep replaced the wooden buildings on the top of the old mound. The original stonework is still visible inside the keep. The outside looks almost new because it was refaced about a hundred years ago. But it is adorned in the original pattern of four rows of semicircular arches of varying heights on each face. After the conquest, there was an influx of foreigners into the city, Normans, Bretons, Frenchmen, Flemings. They settled in a new district, the large croft or field, which extended from the castle ditch to where St Giles Church now stands and which became known as Magna Crofta, later contracted to Mancroft. To impress upon the local people the power of their foreign masters, the market was transferred from Tombland to its present site, with a Norman church of St Peter and St Paul on the south side, and on the north, the Norman toll booth, where dues had to be paid, where the Guildhall now stands. The oldest dwelling house now existing in Norwich was built about 1175 by Jernet the Jew, who probably lent money to finance the building of the cathedral. It is now part of the music house, Wensome Lodge, in King Street. The arched and vaulted cellars must have been his storehouses. The Norman kings had come and gone, but the lovely cathedral and massive castle remained, and a medieval town came into being. It depended upon trade for its existence. It was the chief market town of one of the most thickly populated districts in the land. Subsidiary markets became necessary. 
Horses, for instance, were sold outside St. Stephen's Church in rampant Horse Street. A new kind of citizen appeared in the 13th century. Friars, named in accordance with their habits, black friars, grey friars, white friars, and Augustinian canons. We have a constant reminder of the power of these preaching orders, for St Andrew's and Blackfriars Halls together form the great church of the Dominicans, the most complete friary church surviving in England. Chapelfield Gardens take their name from the Chapel of St Mary, which stood near the site of the Theatre Royal and the Assembly House. Chapel Field was ploughed land until the dissolution of the monasteries, but was later converted to pasture and then used as an archery ground. In the 13th century too, the great hospital was founded for poor chaplains, too ill or too old to work the first almshouses in England. Trouble often broke out between the monks of the cathedral and the citizens. A brawl between them at Tombland Fair in 1272 caused the prior to prepare for attack. Punishment was swift and harsh. Thirty citizens were dragged to death by horses. More worthwhile was the order that the citizens must build a new gateway to the monastic precinct. It stands today, the lovely Ethelbert Gate. Walls, gates, towers were completed in 1334. A goodly stretch remains along Chapelfield Road, and another with the Black Tower along Carrow Hill. The Black Death came to Norwich in January 1349, carried by black rats through crowded, insanitary houses. It has been estimated that 2,000 people died out of a population of 6,000. Plague came again in 1361 and 1369. Famine stalked the streets. The churchyard of St. Peter Mancroft had to be extended. The 15th century was one of contrasts. Norwich was dominated by an oligarchy of rich merchants, powerful men, many of whom became mayors. Some built or improved existing houses like the Bridewell and Strangers Hall and Suckling House. Others built elaborate chantry chapels, like that in St Michael's, Coslany. This was indeed an age of building. The Cow Tower, the Market Cross, the Guild Hall, the City Water Mills all appeared at this time. But above all, between 1430 and 1530, Norwich was given that which still distinguishes it from all other cities, its wealth of medieval churches. In the first half of the 16th century, 14 parish churches were destroyed, as were all save one of the great friaries. Thanks to the foresight of Deputy Mayor Augustine Stewart, St Andrew's Hall and Blackfriars Hall were saved. Augustine Stewart was a silk merchant who lived opposite to the Erpingham Gate on the corner of Tombland Alley. But this was also a time of economic decline and massive unemployment. Robert Kett of Wyndham, led 20,000 peasants onto Mousehold Heath, demanding an end to the enclosure of common land and to bondage, and an end to inflation. But they were no match for royalist troops with German mercenaries and Welsh gunners. 3,000 died in a pitched battle. 
The rest fled in disarray. Their leader was hanged at the castle gate. In the reign of Elizabeth, religious refugees from the Netherlands were invited to settle here. The idea was that these strangers, as they were called, should manufacture cloths new to Norwich and teach local weavers how to make them. They did recapture the export market, but they were reluctant to teach their skills to the natives, and Norwich weavers were slow to learn. The strangers did, however, introduce their love of gardens and canaries. The Walloons among them, who spoke French, were given the Church of St Mary the Less, now a storehouse for furniture in Queen Street, for their worship. The Flemish contingent worshipped in Blackfriars Hall. Queen Elizabeth honoured the city with a visit. They say that the bed whereon she slept is still preserved in the maid's head, and ordinary visitors may sleep in it. A less exalted visitor was William Kemp, the actor, who, for a bet, Morris danced from London to Norwich, taking nine days and finishing with a leap over the churchyard wall in Maddermarket.